let's switch gear okay, uh, to input and output. These are also actually closely related to exceptions and interrupts. Okay, so now that you know we have seen how to build the microprocessor, right? We have built the main memory. Uh, we also need to make sure that our computer can talk to the outside world, right? So that's where you know we need to bring in this the input and output devices, like you know uh, hard disks, right? Keyboards, right? And graphic cards and you know, network cards and such. Um, and usually we have uh, additional interconnects or buses like this. You know, some of those are faster, some of those are slower, depending on the different kind of I/O devices that we're using. And they are connected to the main memory, to the memory system, somehow. Okay. So this is actually an extension. To some extent, this is an extension of the memory system. Okay. And uh, we're going to be leveraging the extent extension to speed up some of the I/O accesses. This is something that we're going to see pretty soon. Okay, so what kind of uh, I/O devices do we deal with? Right? Do we use these days? Right. So here are some examples. Uh, notice that I intentionally, you know, cluster these things together and then I cluster these things together. Right. Why? Is there a reason I do this? What's my, what's the, you know, why I'm doing this, right? Why am I using this layout? Any guesses? Bottom ones, the bottom ones are storage. Um, close, right? Very good, right? This one actually is a sort of a NIC network interface card. This is for networking. It's like for Ethernet. I think one of you just brought up, right? Misha just brought up Ethernet. Any other suggestions? Right. How do you classify these two, right? these two groups? Very good, Pietro. Right. Amitra is also saying the same thing. Uh, Raga, I think you are right. So that's another way to look at it. Although not everything needs to be real time. But if you look at these two clusters, right? These two groups, one is right. Human facing, right? These are human facing, and these are really computer facing, right? So these are the IO devices, right? So whatever is being uh, transferred or output here uh, can be only understood by the computer, right? And these are the human facing devices. But in general, you know, we call these IO devices, but I just want to make sure that you guys know that there's actually some distinction. distinction. Okay. And here's a example system. Right, this is a complete computer system. Uh, this is not a very recent one, but this one is actually good enough. This is already a very good template and a very good representative, uh, representative system. So this is where we have, uh, I think over here I have uh, two processors, but we are only using one. It's an Intel uh, Xeon processor. It's a server chip. Um, this is not too new, but this one is powerful enough. Okay, so it's here, this one is connected to this uh, main memory. Uh, I'm defining a whole bunch of jargons here. And like, I think many of you have seen this before, right? This is not something that you guys need to know, right? You guys don't need to remember the, the, the shorthand, also the full name, right? This is really optional, okay? This size is optional for you to prepare a final exam. But these are good to know. Right, like DIM is really the, the slot that we use to, right, to install the main memory. And DDR is the, the memory interface standard. So the processor can interact, right? So with the main memory, it's really the memory bus. Uh, this one is really fast. And then there's an additional so-called IO controller hub. Okay, there's also some additional hardware module. And this is usually sitting on the, the motherboard. And this is, this is something that we used to, to interface with the, the different kind of IO devices. For example, the hard disk, okay. uh, serial ADA or SADA. So this is the, the interface for the, you know, this uh, storage device. And this one LPC means a low pin count interface, I believe. This is where we use to interface with keyboard and mouse and such. Of course, you, you guys know USB, right? 
And there's also something that we use to interface with faster uh, devices like you know, GPU, uh, or audio processing unit, okay, like PCIe. So this is where we use PCI. PCI means uh, peripheral component internet, interconnect. Okay, so this is the uh, representative system. Uh, we're going to be using this as an example. Right? Again, you guys don't need to remember any of these uh, acronyms. Uh, these are just good to know. First, we have something called I.O. controllers, right? I.O. controller. What exactly does I.O. controller do? An I.O. controller basically uh, manages one or more, right? Peripheral devices. So the, the function of this controller is to re-coordinate the data transfers between the devices and the rest of the compute systems. And also, uh, usually we have this interface. We have a set of uh, registers or special registers for communicating with the processor. We have something called command register. Uh, this is where the, the CPU OS, okay? Of course, you know, India and everything is the same from the CPU, right? Um, the CPU will write to this command register and tell the device to do certain task. And there's also this uh, status register. This is read by the, the processor or OS. So this indicates the current status, whether you know, the current device is busy or ready for a new task. Oh, there's some error that's going on. This is indicated by the, uh, the so-called status register. And then we have the data, right? Of course, we need to move data in and out, depending whether you know, we have a, a read, a read, and, a read write device or read-only device or, you know, uh, and such, right? That, that determines the interface for the data part. Okay, so this part, you know, is fairly, uh, right? So, you know, this is, sort of natural, right? So we do need this kind of interfaces. We need to send a command, a bit of control, and we need to provide status, and then we need to communicate, right? We need to send uh, data in and out. And, um, but how exactly do we access, right? You know, we do want to communicate with these IO devices. So how exactly do we control them? How, do we, how exactly do we communicate with them? One way we can do is, you know, we can, act, uh, we can allocate we can, in our instruction set, right, or I say, we can create additional or dedicated I.O. instructions. For example, you know, for a mouse, right, for a keyboard, let's say, you know, I have a keyboard load, right, or mouse load instruction in the I say. Uh, and then only OS, right, of course, only the, the privileged software can use these instructions. But is this a good idea? Is this scalable? Is it extensible enough? What do you guys think? Do you like this? Do you like this solution? Right. Is it per I/O device? We create a, a dedicated instruction. If not, what's the downside? Right. Very good, Ambrose. Right. No, this is really not extensible. Right. This is not uh, general enough. Right. Basically, for new devices, right, we have to create new instruction. But there are devices that we haven't uh, invented yet. But we don't want our system, right? to be updated for every new device that we introduce, that we insert into the computer system. So these are you know, mostly useful for embedded systems, right? where you know, we have a fixed set of uh, IO devices. And for general purpose systems, this is something that we use. We usually use memory map IOs. Okay, what exactly does it mean? Something called MM IO, okay? memory map IO. This is where we basically treat, right? Remember we have this, uh, see here, we have this uh, registers, right? These are also storage, right? These are registers. So why don't we, this is something that we can read and write. So why don't we assign addresses to these uh, registers for these IO devices? So that they are just part of the, you know, this uh, physical memory state space. We have a special portion of the addresses that are allocated for these uh, IO, uh, the registers on the IO controllers. That's something that uh, we can easily extend. Make sense, okay? This is also a lot more portable for, you know, for different system, all we need to do is to, for different new devices, all we need to do is to allocate additional addresses and then we're done. Of course, you know, it's up to the OS, right? Also the hardware to interpret, right? The, the hardware OS need to agree, right? What kind of devices they are dealing with. Okay, so this is called memory map IO. 
Right. I mean, that means that we map these registers, these IO devices, to this uh, the memory space that we are using. Okay. And we also need to worry about the actual data transfer, right? How exactly do we move data back and forth between IO and main memory? There's a relatively inefficient way to do this, right? This is something that's designed for a low data rate transfer. It's called PIO, program IO, program IO. So this is where the, the processor arbitrates the transfer of the data from the device and the memory, the main memory. The processor actually needs to, to be involved with every single data transaction, which is actually uh, usually less efficient. So this is like, you know, uh, or maybe let me introduce the DMA first, right? Then we can make a comparison. DMA uh, means direct memory access. This is a lot more efficient. So this is where uh, we only need a processor to set up the, the data transfer, to set up the, the transaction. Okay, say that, you know, I want to transfer a certain amount of data between the IO device and the, the main memory. And then the processor will step outside of the loop. The processor will just let the main memory and the IO to work together to complete the actual data transfer. So since, you know, in many cases we are transferring, like let's say we are transferring a page, we're moving a page of data from the disk to the main memory, that could take millions of cycles. That's super slow, right? So that's where the processor can just let the, the memory and the, the I.O. to do their job. And in the meantime, the processor will handle another task, another program. The processor will just run another program. It's got DMA. Right. Um, right, again, you know, for moving a large amount of data, you guys can probably see that it's obviously more efficient, right? So the processor only needs to say, like, can you send one page of data to the main memory? That's it. And in this case, uh, the, pro the processor, think about the processor, what the processor can do, the processor may have to load, right? One byte at a time or one word at a time from the IO device using load and then use store, right? And use another instruction store to store to the IO or the, or the, main, or the main memory. That's a much store. Okay, so this DMA, again, I'm just, you know, throwing a lot of the terms, right? A lot of the new terms, a lot of the new concepts to you guys. Uh, you know, just hang there, right? Uh, I'm going to show you a concrete example pretty soon. So we just talk about how to move data, right, between the I/O device and uh, the processor. Now let's look at you know, if this data transaction. Let's say we are using DMA, right? When this data transfer transfer has completed, how does the processor know that this is done? This is where we can either use some something called polling. Okay, that's where the processor will constantly or frequently check. The status register. And there is a status register, right? The product can just constantly check. Uh, but again, it's not a good idea, right? So this only is only useful for a small amount of the data transfer. Uh, this is just too costly, right? This is like, you know, uh, during an exam, I keep asking you guys, right, are you done, right? Or done with your exam? Can I collect the exam or not? That's cut polling, right? Obviously, this is annoying and it's not efficient enough. Instead, we use so-called interrupt, okay? So now that this interrupt, right? See here, uh, you know, we talk about exception and interrupt early on, right? And then we start, then we just focus on the exception. This is where the interrupt comes, comes back into the picture. This is where we use interrupt. Uh, basically, this is something that happens outside the processor. And this is where the IO device can send a notification to the processor. For example, if this data transfer is already done, the IO device will just send an interrupt. Okay, it's also some sort of event to the processor, telling the processor that it's done. Okay, this is basically like, you know, uh, again coming back to the classroom analogy, right? Uh, it's like basically when I don't want to ask every every second, I don't want to do the polling, I don't want to do poll the class, right? Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Every minute, instead, you know, you guys can use the chat window, or you, can, you guys can raise your hand. Right, to let me know, to interrupt the class, right? To let me know there is a question. This is basically interrupt driven help. Okay, so things are, you know, somewhat abstract right now, right? That's where we wanna make to uh, look at, the, take a look at the concrete example. And I'm not gonna read this list. 
uh, this is useful for you guys, right? So this is the sequence that I'm going to show you. Uh, later on, if this is not too clear, then come back to this page, right? Okay, so let's look at um, a program, program A. Program A. And this program A is doing a load in the mem stage, load. And this one, this load triggers a page fault. Of course, page fault means that there will be a page, uh, there, there, will be, there will be a TLB miss, right? And it's not gonna be in the main memory, so it's a page fault. So that's where we have an exception, right? there'll be exception. And we put a PC of the faulting instruction, right? PC of the load, of this load. Okay, we save it. And we also save the cost of the exception, which is page fault, right? Okay, so you, you guys still remember the sequence? Uh, what's gonna happen to these instructions? You already saved the instruction of this one, right? We have already saved the instruction, uh, the instruction address of the, the load instruction, the PC of the load. Very good. Uh, we squash these instructions, right? These will become no up. We don't want to execute them because load, right? We don't even know how to complete load yet. We turn this instruction behind load into no ops. Then we load in the, right? That's where we go to ER, right? There's an exception now. We go to ER, we go to the, right, there's an emergency. This is where the, the first instruction in the exception handler comes in. This is basically the doctor of, in the ER. And the instruction, right, in the, this, this instruction handler will do these things. So handler will save the program A state. I'm gonna turn this into a quiz, a special quiz. I'm gonna let you know why it's special. And the, the exception handler will read a cost register, right? The exception cost to determine what kind of a, right, exception we are dealing with. In this case, this is a page fault. So then the um, exception handler will just call the appro appropriate routine, right? Basically, find the specialist in the OS okay? to handle the page fault. This is the sequence. All right, so let's come back to the sequence, right? You know, we are trying to handle page fault, right? So that's where the OS will set up the, the this transfer. And this is we want to use DMA, direct memory access. What the OS needs to do, read OS, of course, make use of the processor, right? To say that, okay, can we read four kilobytes from the disk, starting from certain address, and then we don't write to this memory address, okay, this specific location. <clears throat> this is all handled by the OS. And this can be converted into a command that's sent to the IO controller for the disk, okay? Then after that, OS, right? Uh, the, the processor, right? the processor was running, okay? This processor, right? Was running, right? Was running. Program A, of course, then OS steps in, right? That's why I use was, was running. Um, but now that, you know, it's gonna take million cycles, right? For this, uh, this one, right? It may take million cycles for this transaction to be completed. Uh, we actually get some free cycles, right, to use. This is where the OS can schedule another program on the processor the OS can bring in program B. And uh, this is actually a very important slide, you know, for you guys to understand how the, the computer system work. Although, you know, uh, most of your current uh, computers, like, you know, a cell phone, you know, your laptop have multiprocessors or multiple cores, right? But the thing is we can also run many programs, okay? Sort of concurrently, right? Quote, concurrently, using just a single CPU. How do we do that? Right? So that's where we are doing this kind of, uh, you know, uh, context switching. So we are really trying to, uh, we can quickly switch, right? Program A out and then bring in program B. 
as long as this kind of switching happens fast enough, it's not going to be something that can be noticed by the human, right? Because you know we are doing this as a, even a million cycle, it's not a lot, right? In terms of the absolute time, when we are running a one gigahertz or two gigahertz processor, think about it. Okay. So basically, the the OS and also CPU, they are doing a lot of context switching like this, a program switching. Um, you know, we can. That's how uh, you know we get the illusion that right. So the CPU is running the you know the the browser app, right? The email app, right? The music app, all at the same time. But in in fact, right? In most cases, they are sharing the same physical CPU, same physical hour. It's just that you know they are being swapped in and swapped out in a very fast fast pace. Okay, in a way that you we cannot really realize, we cannot really notice. Okay, so basically uh, the OS brings in another task right? and that's where the OS need to bring in the states, right? We just agree, these are the states that we need to bring in, the PC, the PC of program B and the, the page table register and RF, the, the values in RF. So now uh, the OS switches from program A to program B, right? And at the same time, at the same time, we are doing DMA. You know, there's a whole uh, page worth of data, right? So that's being read out of the disk. Right? Because the IO controller needs to send in another command to the disk saying that can you give me this four kilobytes of data? Then the disk will respond. Okay? The data will be returned to the controller, the disk controller, and then the disk controller will transfer, right? Again, using DMA. To the right, to the main memory without without any help from the processor. The processor is, right now is running program B. The programmer is not going to babysit this DMA transfer. Right? The program will, the, the the processor will just say right grab four kilobytes of data, and then DMA will just take care of the job. Okay, any questions so far? So what happens after this is done? What happens next, guys? How does the processor know that this thing is completed? Again, I, you know, I introduced many terms. Okay, very good. It is an interrupt, right? Interrupt, one more time, right? Interrupt is something that's triggered by an external device outside of microprocessor. This is where okay, the dial controller after the DMA transaction is done. See here, I'm using the blue. The blue lines means control or command, right? The black line, okay, the black line. So this one, these mean data. That's a color code. The blue line, so over here, sends the, the command. Oh, this is the interrupt, right? In this case, this is really an interrupt. Say that the IO or the DMA is completed. So what does the processor do after this? How the processor receive the interrupt? Okay, the processor sees the interrupt, right? Over here, you know, I further extend this. I, in addition to exception, I say exception slash interrupt, because these two are sort of similar, right? Very similar. And we can also have the interrupt PC, right? And interrupt cause, uh, very similar, right? We can have interrupt handler as well. In, in fact, we do have interrupt handler right, in our system. So basically, uh, once the, the project received the interrupt, it's going to save, right? E may determine uh, to, right, to suspend this program, right? The program B, and then go back to the, right? Go back to the, the program A. So that's something that OS may determine to do. So basically, then we need to save the PC. We need to save the state, right? The state of the program B, including the PC. Of this addition, so this is the the instruction right? that uh, you know we we will finish this thing. We'll finish this one, this one, this one. We'll let it go. We'll let it complete in the pipeline, and we'll finish this guy. Uh, we'll save this guy, the instru the instruction address of this guy, into this uh, PC, into the program state, right? As part of the program state, and also everything in the RF, right? 
and there's a page table register, tap the save, then we, we can now run program A again. Right? So because page fault was handled, remember that program A had this uh, load instruction, right, which triggered the page fault. So then OS can mark program A as runnable. So uh, in the in the in practice, things are actually more complicated, right? You know, there might be multiple programs that are being suspended. Then uh, it's really up to the scheduler in the OS. The OS scheduler may have certain you know heuristic, they have certain policy that determines which program to resume next. Okay. Um, but in this case, Right. Uh, let's say you know we only have one program that's being suspended, which is program A, then which is market runnable, then the OS program can choose to run program A. Right. Again, we need to load the, the program state. Okay. So one thing I want to notice, you know, we have been just looking at a simplified, right? A very simple processor. So in practice, there are more things that we may need to save okay, with a, a more compact processor. And we so we said there are additional things that we have to say as part of the problem state. Okay, um, there's a question. Amber is asking, is there a problem with spending a program for too long? Uh, excellent question, uh, Ambrose. Very good question. Okay, um, what do you guys think? So this is actually related to again how we run multiple program concurrently, right? Using a single processor. So what do we do? So if you want to want to give this uh, the user the illusion that right many things are running in parallel all at once. What do we do? Can we allow one program to run for too long? Yes or no? Is it a good idea? Yeah, we have program A and program B, right? You know, let's say there's no page fault, no page fault. Right? Program A is running smoothly and program B is running smoothly. One's music app, right? You're playing the music. The other one is you know you're writing email, right, email app. Okay, obviously you don't want to right, run one program for too long. Otherwise the other program will not be responsive. Right? Then the, the user will tell. Okay, yes, so that, that's also part of the concern by the, the scheduler. The scheduler needs to, there's actually a timer as well in the OS. The timer will also send the interrupt to the, the CPU and OS may decide okay, whether we want to switch out the current program or not. Very good question. Okay, but here's the key point. Okay. You know, the key thing is uh, while we're doing this IO transaction, right, we're reading from the disk, the processor has a ton of free time right, to do other work because program A cannot continue anymore. So that's where uh, the processor uh, make use of DMA. Right? Pro the processor needs to run another task or another program. We need to, use, we need to make use of DMA. The processor cannot use the polling to handle the data transfer. DMA is useful here, which free the processor right, from doing some babysitting. And we also use interrupt driven IO. Again, the processor does not need to check every clock cycle, you know, of every 10,000 clock cycles, right? Whether this IO device has finished its task or not. It's really up to the processor. It's really up to the IO device, right? Up to the IO device, the IO controller to tell the processor that this transaction is done. So these are the, the key points. Okay, any questions? This is the, the whole sequence. Okay. All right, okay, so if not, okay, so here's the picture that I showed you guys, right? In the very first lecture, you know, uh, the promise is we're gonna build the whole computer system, right? Starting from a, a simple gate, okay? And bottom up, right? So we are gonna be using this building block Right, to create a slightly more complex building block. And we keep doing this, right? We keep building abstractions. And later we build, uh, right, so, you know, ALU, right, memories, cache. So that's allowed us to build a whole processor and we incorporate, integrate this processor into this whole computer system, which includes the main memory and the IOs. Okay, and there you go. So if you follow, right, these lectures up to this point, uh, congrats, right, uh, you guys have a, uh, now, I just, I just have a very solid understanding of right, how a basic computer works. Okay. In the next lecture, uh, we're going to be talking a bit more about the final exam. And also, I'll give you guys, uh, uh, I'll also cover some uh, more advanced and pretty interesting topics. Okay. I'll see you guys.